Electrical energy is probably the most versatile and widely used form of energy we have. Its usefulness is mostly in its ability to change into other forms of energy. We change it into the mechanical energy of motors and tape drives, into light, into heat, and into sound. But electrical energy has one big drawback. It's one of the most difficult forms of energy to store. Usually, when we want to store electricity, we first have to turn it into some other form of energy that does store easily. Batteries are stored chemical energy that's turned into electricity when it's hooked into the circuit. The amount of electrical energy that can be stored depends on the amount of chemical energy in the battery. A dam holds water which has gravitational potential energy. We saw in the last section that when the water is released, this potential energy becomes kinetic energy, which can do mechanical work of spinning turbines. That is then turned into electricity by the generator. So in a way, the dam first stores the electricity in the potential energy of water. There are other methods to store electrical energy that are much more convenient than water or chemicals. They don't store for very long, but they're very useful in industry. Sometimes a large amount of charge is needed in a short period of time. Two devices can do this. One is a capacitor, the other is an inductor. Let's look at the first case, a capacitor. Capacitors are sometimes used in starting up heavy-duty electric motors. The capacitor delivers a charge when the motor needs it the most, as it first comes up to speed. A capacitor is a very simple device if you unwrap it and straighten it out. It's nothing more than two plates that are separated by an insulator. The electric charge in this diagram is represented by the plus and minus symbols. Before the capacitor is charged, there's an equal number of positive and negative charges on each plate. A voltage source, such as a battery, does work separating the charges. In other words, it creates an excess of negative charge on one plate and leaves positive charges behind on the other. If the plates are disconnected, the charges will remain separated because the plates are insulated. Since opposite charges attract, they will try to recombine. It took work to separate the charges so they can do work when they come back together. This ability to do work in the future is potential energy. As long as the plates are not connected, that potential will remain. It's much like the potential energy stored in a bow when it's drawn. The amount of electrical potential in a capacitor is called its capacitance. Releasing that potential, like releasing the bow, is done when the plates of the capacitor are reconnected. The charge suddenly flows back and there's once again an equal amount of positive and negative charge on each plate. It's the sudden release of this electrical potential energy that can be used to do the work of starting the motor. Capacitors store electrical energy, but unlike batteries, capacitors release their charge very quickly rather than over a long period of time. Here's a more familiar use of a capacitor. The strobe light in this flash needs a higher current than what the batteries can deliver. So the batteries slowly add charge to a capacitor. The red light indicates that the capacitor has enough charge between its plates. Hitting the button releases the charge all at once, giving a high current which does the work of making the light. The release of the stored electrical energy in a capacitor is very similar to the release of the stored mechanical energy in the spring of a mousetrap. Now let's look at the second form of storing electrical energy, the inductor. An inductor is another simple device. It's really nothing more than a coil of wire. 
To understand inductance, we have to look at one of the unusual properties of electricity. Any current that passes through a wire has a magnetic field that appears around it. If the wire is wound into a coil, the magnetic field grows larger because more wire has been squeezed into a smaller space. If a piece of iron is inserted inside the coil, the magnetic field grows larger again. All this simply by running a current through the wire. This is essentially how an electromagnet works. The magnetic field is only there when the current is flowing. When the electric current is shut off, the magnetic field disappears. But a magnetic field is a form of energy, so it cannot just vanish or be destroyed. So what the magnetic field does is turn back into an electric current in the wire. It only happens for a short time, but it is nonetheless a release of energy which can be used to do work. An inductor is like a flywheel which continues to turn after its power source is disconnected. An inductor coil continues to do work for a short time after its power is shut off. It makes sense that if an electric current can generate a magnetic field, a magnetic field can generate or induce an electric current. The inductance, or the size of the current that's produced, depends on the number of loops in the coil, the size of the wire, its length, and the type of material in the core. Inductors are most useful as filters in areas where current may fluctuate. This one smooths out the current for a car radio. These two devices are methods of temporarily storing electrical energy. It can be stored on the plates of a capacitor where the charge is separated and has the potential to recombine, or as the potential energy of a magnetic field in an inductor. This is why electricity is such a valuable form of energy. It can change into many different forms, so we can store it, move it around, and use it to do work in a variety of jobs.